Startup Insider is made possible by the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Working Group of the Finger Lakes Regional Economic Development Council, XL Partners, a Rochester-based national leader in seed stage venture investments, the Technical Entrepreneurship and Management Master of Science program at the University of Rochester, and this episode's feature sponsor, Complimar Partners, a market-leading global supply chain provider delivering value-add third-party logistics and packaging solutions that allow businesses to reduce cost, lower inventory, and improve performance. Hello and welcome to Startup Insider. I'm Alex Episodchain. This is a program that serves to inform and empower entrepreneurs in our area to grow and to succeed here in Rochester and the Finger Lakes. And today we're going to tackle a topic that's central to the entrepreneurship journey, how to raise venture capital funding. Today we have a panel that's going to answer many questions for us, many key questions, including how does a startup know that they're actually ready for venture capital funding? Once you actually get a coveted meeting with a venture capitalist, what do you say to him or her? How much money do you ask for? And are there particular challenges to being a company based here in the Finger Lakes when you're going out to seek venture capital funding? We have a great panelist today, all of which are experienced venture capitalists who make investments here in the Rochester area. Our first panelist is Teresa Mazzullo, CEO of Excel Partners. Uh, Excel Partners is a Rochester-based venture capital firm uh, focusing on seed stage investments, and recently you were named among the top 30 in the country in terms of most active seed fund investors. Uh, welcome correct. to the program. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Kevin Phelps, general partner at Trillium Group. Trillium Group uh, was, was formed right here in Rochester, mm -hmm. New York in 1997, and since that time, Trillium has, has funded many companies, many startups in our area uh, with, with any, everything from seed to early stage uh, investments. Mm -hmm. And finally, we have Brian Modell. Uh, Brian Modell is a managing partner at Stonehenge Growth Equity Partners, which recently raised a new $40 million fund. Congratulations, Thank Brian. You. And while Brian's office is in New York City, he focuses his investment activities on Upstate and in particular on Rochester and Ryan also serves showing his commitment to Upstate he also serves as the president of the Upstate Venture Association of New York welcome everyone to to this important thank program thank you Alex thank you. Nice. and let's start off uh, perhaps giving each of you a couple of minutes to talk a little bit more about your firms and in particular what is the typical investment and what type of technologies are you looking to invest in and we can start with you Teresa okay so as you accurately stated uh, in uh, the introduction Excel is a seed stage venture fund and we invest in technologies that are just emerging out of the communities and the universities across the upstate region we invest in technologies across the board we do not have any one particular domain expertise we actually have investments in IT software, in the life science space, medical device, even in material sciences as well as energy. The average investment for Excel is around $250,000 to $500,000 in the physical science space and we go up to seven fifty dollars in the life science. Now our average deal is around a million because we do look to co-invest with partners like Stonehenge and angels in the community. Thank you, Kevin. Well, Trillium sort of picks up where Teresa leaves off and that, that we actually had our roots in seed stage, stage investing and have moved down to the uh, early stage and growth investing. Uh, as Teresa points out, her investments tend to be in the less than a million dollar size you know, when those companies start to mature and, and need either facilities or need to uh, commercialize their products, that's really where a Trillium steps in and we're looking probably at a between one and five million dollars worth of investment in typically t several stages of, of investment. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brian? Stonehenge Growth Equity Partners actually overlaps both what Trillium and Excel do. Um, our fund, a growth equity fund, is focused on companies that are typically at three million dollars in revenue and more. Uh, we, we, we look at that level as a way to validate that the technology works and that there are customers that are purchasing the product. We look to invest um, one to five million dollars in each investment. We also have a pool of capital. We're one of the New York State's Innovate New York managers as long uh, with Excel as mm -hmm. well, where we focus on earlier stage companies. We still look at companies that are post-revenue, but we're looking to help those companies grow, help them take their products to market. 
Now, we've started talking and using the, the term venture capital already yeah. many times, and I think it would be great, uh, especially for individuals who have not mm -hmm. actually sought venture capital funding, maybe to back up a little bit and talk uh, in, in basic terms about what is venture capital. And, and, and Kevin, can you uh, perhaps sure. tell us a little well, bit, what, what is the process and what's the venture capital looking, capitalist mm -hmm. looking to get out of it? Well, I, I think you know, when you look at venture capital, it's a very broad term. Alex, and, and I think you want to kind of carve it up into, into segments as we've talked about a little bit. Mm -hmm. You have the seed stage, which are typically extremely early in, uh, investments, oftentimes coming out of universities with individual scientists or professors or entrepreneurs. Then you have the early stage, which is that next, next segment where you're trying to go from a technology which is perhaps now proven to commercializing a technology, which is a challenge unto itself. Then you get into the growth stage, which is really com taking it from a fledgling company into a strong position in the market. And then you get into some later stages where you start to really get banking-like uh, ventures, uh, things which might be referred to as mezzanine capital and uh, m uh, buyout capital, where you actually start to take a more sophisticated view of it. What, what we are looking at, actually, is trying to qualify those companies as they come in the door, because we, we recognize that oftentimes it's better for us to hand it off to Teresa because it's not in our space, and maybe vice versa, because we're, we are investing you know, I, with certain criteria to get certain types of returns which are appropriate for us, but may be different at the different stages of growth. And, and what is really the, the business of venture capital? What does a venture capitalist look, look, look to get? How do they view the world? Well, as, as institutional investors, and what that means is that we raise capital from other investors, from banks, from pension funds, from high net worth individuals. And we manage that investment pool of capital for typically a five-year investment period where we're looking for companies to invest and then we work with those companies through, through board rights and through connections and networks to help those companies grow. And then at the end, there's a liquidity event. The company is either uh, takes on new capital, the company is sold, and that allows the investors to get their capital back. We, pr we make a, a return of investments to our investors, and then we get to start all over again with the next fund. So people are very accustomed to understanding a shareholder. A corporation has a responsibility to the shareholder. In the case of venture capitalists, we have a responsibility to our limited partners. And just as a shareholder wants to get dividends and a, and, and a return on their investment, so too do our limited partners expect to get a return on their investment. Right. I think it's, Alex, it's important to recognize that each of us in our own right, we are businesses. Mm -hmm. we, are, we were startup capital, you know, startup uh, companies ourselves, we had to raise the company money. Our money happens to be, we're in the business of selling investments or selling uh, returns on investment. So we had to raise the money. Now we are expected to identify the right opportunities mm -hmm. to provide yields on the money. And within a finite period of time, we have to return the money. So Correct. people, the entrepreneur needs to recognize that we are businesses too, and we have responsibilities, as is pointed out, for our investors. So every deal that we look at, we look at as a, a high potential deal that has the opportunity, as Brian said, for a successful exit. And they can either exit by way of a merger and acquisition or through an IPO. But until they have a successful exit of some kind, we don't have uh, an exit ourselves to get out of the deal. One of the, one of the important dynamics for a venture capital firm is that it's structured as a 10-year vehicle in most cases, where you're expected to find companies and make investments during the first five years, and then harvest those investments through exits that, that we've been talking about in the second part. Right. So we're all, as we're looking at what the return profile is and what returns we're looking to generate, you also have to think about how much time is that going to take. So part of the decision process is how fast is this company growing? Are we going to be able to help the company get to the point where there's an exit in the time frame we need? Now, typically, how many companies are, are you looking at each year and kind of out of, how large is the pool of applicants <laughs> and, and how many uh, investments do you tend to make in a, in a given year? Well, in our case, and you'll see a distinction here between uh, myself and, and Brian and Kevin, because we are seed stage, we are actually, actually, we receive about 300 deals that come our way in over the transom, as we refer to it. We can immediately uh, eliminate those down to about 84, 85 that we take a first look at. And from those, we will invite probably about 50 to 55 companies. And we are looking at an investor, or basically doing an investor pitch a week. And out of those deals, we will probably invest in somewhere around six to eight deals at the most. And that's a lot compared to what my counterparts will tell you. Right. 
And I think, again, picking up on that, our, our, because of the size of our fund and our location, we are actually probably using more of a network uh, marketing strategy rather than using the internet. So we don't look to get 100 deals. We're actually looking to network. Well, we don't actually use the internet. I mean, it's uh, because we're connected right. to the universities across upstate okay. that they're coming in sure. from upstate yeah, New York. I guess my point yeah. is that, yeah. that we're looking to actually pre-qualify the deals. So yeah. I would look for a call from Teresa that one of her companies is looking for the next stage, or I'd look for a call from Brian that one of his companies is looking for a co-investment, or I'd get a call from an attorney or an accountant. So we really use that process. So I encourage the anyone that's looking to raise money to really use your professionals and the networks that they have to try to get access to one of us. So even though all of you obviously have e emails out there, sure. there's phone numbers, th this is really not the way to, to contact the investor no, capitalists. No, 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 it, it isn't. Like. Well, and also, you know, as, as you talk about building relationships, particularly in areas like upstate New York, it's all relationship driven. I always say it's much more like farming than it is hunting. I met with a company before coming here today where I initially met the CEO in 2002 as they were launching their business. And it, it takes a while. It takes a while to build trust in the community. It takes a while to see the businesses and to, to learn more about them as they grow. So the referrals and the relationships are important. But it's, it's very rare that somebody will send in a business plan and will say, we like this, we want to make an investment. It takes, it, there's a getting to know you period, then there's a getting to know the people around you period. I mean, that's mm -hmm. really a big part of, of, the, of the funnel process that we go through before taking the three or more, 300 or more plans that come in and narrowing it down to, in our case, uh, my partner and I will probably close somewhere between four and six investments in any calendar year. Um, it's two to three per partner because that's how long it takes to, to get the due diligence done and find the right company. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and when we come back, we're actually going to dig into that a little bit more, and we're gonna find out, as part of creating that relationship, what is it that the uh, entrepreneur actually needs to do when mm -hmm. he meets one of you. We'll be right back after this word from this episode's feature sponsor. Startup Insider's featured sponsor is Complimar Partners. Complimar Partners is a market-leading provider of fulfillment and contract packaging services, assembly, distribution, e-commerce, direct mail, print, and reverse logistics solutions. With over 70 years of experience and facilities in New York, Pennsylvania, and Nevada, Complimar is able to deliver value-add third-party logistics solutions that allow businesses to reduce cost, lower inventory, and improve performance. Welcome back to Startup Insider. We left off the other segment talking about the relationship that really is uh, necessary to build over time with a venture capitalist. But once an entrepreneur actually gets lucky enough to, to, to have the meeting with the venture capitalist, uh, what do they say? What do they present, uh, Kevin? Well, I, I guess, you know, my, I'll give you my style. I, I tend to meet a number of people uh, at local, local breakfast establishment. That's my style, is I find it's easier and it's, it's kind of more comforting to just meet over breakfast and keep it very casual. So when people first meet with me, I, I'm looking to create a personal relationship to understand who they are. Uh, because both Teresa and I are from the community, I think you know knowing a network of who they know and who we know helps my due diligence because I can track them very quickly throughout the community. But what, I, what I'm looking for is, is several things. Uh, I want to see, first off, do they understand what product they're, or what business they're going after? Do they have a good feel for their for the challenges of the markets they're going in, the size of the market? Uh, really, do they understand? Are they ready to be talking to me? And, and many times, I, I will tell them what they should know and what they you know that they're too early and you know, let's meet for breakfast two months from now or something. Or possibly, mm -hmm. if their stage of growth is different, I might refer them you know to another resource within the community. But but absent that, if if you have a successful person, uh, you know typically there's not going to be a lot of paper. There's going to be mostly just dialogue and a uh, very qualitative. Uh, kind of discussion about what they're doing. And then we can, you know, over time in second meetings, we'll get into quantitative and, you know, uh, valuations and those kinds of things. But I really want to understand them, their passion for the business, why they're doing it, and really get to know them personally before I really worry too much about the business. And, and, and Teresa, I mean, how relevant, for instance, is the business plan or a fully formed deck, uh, a PowerPoint presentation by the time they, they, they get to you? What kind of information uh, does Excel look for? Well, 
Broadly speaking, we typically look at three things, the technology, the market, and the management. And so we're trying to evaluate those three things whenever any entrepreneur comes our way. In terms of the business plans, quite frankly, at the seed stage, and gentlemen, please jump in on mm -hmm. this, see if you agree. At the seed stage, which is the formation stage of a high-tech company startup, when they are just putting their business plan together, which is an iterative process, we require that they have a business plan because we want every entrepreneur to go through the discipline of what it takes to build the business. But the reality, Alex, is that most of the business plans we see at the seed stage are what I fondly refer to as fractured fairy tales. And so mm -hmm. we don't put a lot uh, of stock in the ones that we see, but we require them nonetheless. There's a whole movement uh, right now afoot basically saying the business plans are not, <laughs> not the way to go. I, uh, I, I say very often that the business plan is very valuable to understand how the entrepreneur is thinking about their business or, or that they are thinking about a lot of the various components. But it's not quite as relevant to making the investment decision. It's more valuable to us. So I always say, you know, like they say in real estate, I look at management, management, and management. Mm -hmm. Because we back um, domain experienced entrepreneurs who are passionate about applying technology to solve a business problem. So what we do, and I do a lot of initial meetings over Skype where I can spend 30 minutes looking somebody in the eye or we do it over a cup of coffee. I'm in Rochester a dozen times a year. So f finding a way to have that conversation, understand what drives you, what's your passion. Our prototypical entrepreneur spent 10 years working in an industry, understands the problems that face this industry, left their employer to start a company to solve that problem. Um, and that's really what drives us. That's really where we start. I, th I think the other thing, Alex, uh, understand is, is, for me at least, is that I, I can hire somebody to write a business plan. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you mm -hmm. know, you, uh, I've seen some of your work. Yeah. You, you do a great job of that. So I, I can <laughs> hire you to do that. Thanks. So <laughs> what was more important is, th you know, again, the, the personal relationship and their understanding of it. Most of the uh, Rochester entrepreneurs tend to be first-time entrepreneurs. Right. We don't have serial entrepreneurs who have been through it several times and mm -hmm. know all the drills. Right. So most of them come to us relatively inexperienced. And I think it's part of our role, at least especially the local people, to, to be uh, mentors and to help them through the process. I, ha I have seen Teresa's process, and, and it is fairly disciplined, and, and there's a lot of work to it. And, and I think probably you know, for, for an entrepreneur to get through your process, they do have to put a lot of discipline into it. And I, I think that's good, but I think, it's, you're, I think you're asking them to do that to see that they can do it, Absolutely. not because that's how you're going to evaluate them. So Th I think correct. it's very important to recognize that mm -hmm. in Rochester, New York, you know, we are here to be your mentor and your partner. So if you've got a very good idea, you know, we want to work with you. We don't need you to come in as an expert because you know we can go across the country and find you know make investments in expert companies we're trying to grow rochester companies which we recognize to be early stage and less experienced and that's how we're going to develop the network of great companies is helping them so, so, so if, if actually i'm oh, sure i was just saying if i can interject when when we talk about experienced entrepreneurs recognizing a lot of the entrepreneurs are first-time entrepreneurs mm -hmm. they all come with a, a depth of experience in their industry right. Whether, whether it's working for one of the legacy technology companies in the region or, or coming out of a university with research. And it's, that experience is valuable. We can help them because of our track record and our portfolio, help them with the what does it mean to raise capital and how do mm -hmm. you build your board and those other things about growing the company. But the industry experience and the passion for the solution, mm -hmm. um, that's something that I think that there's a lot of in the region. Yeah. Now, typically when you're dealing with entrepreneurs, actually a lot of you have used kind of the singular form. Uh, do you have a preference around teams uh, as opposed to one entrepreneur? And if so, oh. kind of what does a good team look like? Well, because we are working with a lot of uh, uh, technologies emerging out of the universities, we see scientists who have discovered an enzyme or have a medical device or what have you. And we have a general policy that we will not allow them in to do an investor pitch unless they have corresponding management with them. Because quite frankly, when you get a scientist in the room, it becomes very difficult for them to talk about uh, their business as a business. You know, they want to talk about the technology and not about the business and the strategic growth of the company. And in fact, it's a real failing that we see oftentimes in investor pitches when they allow the scientists to take over the investor pitch and they spend two-thirds of the time talking about the science of the technology mm -hmm. without 
we'll be 20 minutes into it before we ever even really understand what the product is. In fact, I, I, I have a, a, a story from one of our board members. We brought one of our, our companies in and the CEO became ill at the last minute and was unable to make it to the board to talk about the growth of the company. So he sent the scientist in. And I had a conversation with the scientist ahead of time and said, please, do not make this overly scientific. Just give us how the company is doing and so on. He comes in in true to form. He begins talking about the technology and ends up talking about the technology. And when he walked out of the room, one of my board members said to me, Teresa, I feel like I've just watched a foreign film without the subtitles. <laughs> that is not what you want to have happen. And that's why we always require a management person to come alongside the scientists. I think a, little, a, little, a slight exception to that. I, I think, you know, we, we are, again, in our role as mentor, I am not looking to invest in the best accountant. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking to invest in the best Aren't commercialization. By the way, I am, by, I am by this <laughs> and maybe that's why I can do. I can do that myself. Uh, so I, I'm looking. I am looking at the scientists, and and I, I agree. I think the differentiation would be I want the scientists to understand their business right. and, to, and to come to. If they come before that, they're unprepared. Correct. So I, I would rather have see them come with their attorney. Perhaps an accountant. There are great resources in the Rochester community where you can find contract accounting people who can do great work on grant management and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. I don't need to invest in infrastructure. I need to invest right. in science and development and, and the other pieces. I will surround the people with people I know that I trust. I mean, but this topic actually brings up something, and Brian, perhaps you, you can chime in here. Uh, I mean, scientists, yes, sometimes the, the way they communicate it, it, and, and look at a problem is certainly different. Uh, but also, oftentimes, a lot of these scientists, at least in, in the Finger Lakes community, they're not planning to leave their tenured position right. uh, <laughs> at, at a university. <laughs> yes, and so yes. part of I, I know what, what I, obviously investors want to look at is how committed is this person to really give it they're all because entrepreneurship is really hard so uh, how, how do you handle that at that, that Stonehenge? Well my, you know we look at things a little bit differently because most of what we most of the companies we invest in are software and services companies so a guy in a lab coat who invented something is not often our prototypical entrepreneur during that initial meeting we're most interested in who are the salespeople who's driving the growth of the business in companies where there's a scientific founder i think it's very important to to structure it the right way to either make sure that the company controls the technology um, and to have that heart-to-heart -heart conversation you know we're we're looking to invest and eventually sell this company you know what's what's going to happen to them but we're looking more at the business management than the science management in the typical profile of the company we invest in and I, I think, but, but I think you did hit on a very good point because I, you're much closer to the university than we are. But I, I have personally taken about four companies out of the University of Rochester, which is probably a major source of, of technology. And it, it, it becomes very frustrating from our standpoint because the university has fairly strict guidelines that you need to understand about how much time a tenured professor can, can devote to a business, what level of commitment, what the licensing strategies mm -hmm. are. So if you're going, if you are happen to come out of the university system as the entrepreneur, you need to understand that very well because the university does enforce it pretty well. Mm -hmm. And and I think the university is by itself growing in how they manage the scientists because I don't think they're quite as adept at it as some of the Stanfords and MITs that have been doing it much longer. But I think the university wants to get there, but I think you really need to understand those rules. Otherwise, you're going to frustrate both the documentation phase of what legal rights is the investor getting or the company getting, and, and also from the personal standpoint of the entrepreneur, they just need to know what their employment contract says. Mm -hmm. And just maybe kind of quickly going around, mm -hmm. so, so would each of your companies actually fund uh, a startup that has just one founder? A scientific person? Or, or, well, or is, yeah, are you qualifying the, that? No. It depends. I, th I would have to say it depends. If it's in the software space, or, or we would absolutely take a look at it. I wouldn't make a well, When you statement. define founder as a lead person, yes. Typically, they mm -hmm. will come with their... Uh, graduate student or their right. PhD or whatever they will bring with them, but typically there's one visionary that's driving the company rather Correct. than a group. Yeah. I would agree. There, there's, typically, there's typically one person who's, who's driving the development, um, but they will usually come with several co-founders. Mm -hmm. um, we would not have a problem backing that one person for the right opportunity. For the right, for the right we, person. We're very, uh, we go to the, even to the point of educating the, particularly the, the research scientists who, do, who, who have to make that decision about leaving the university and making this a full-time occupation or staying within the university. We've, we've done both. Mm 
and there's good examples of both within the community, but educating them on what their commitment means, not just them, but their family, because a lot of times, you know, people are asked to put personal guarantees on, on uh, certainly the assets of their company. They're putting their families mm -hmm. at risk. They, they should understand the time commitments to try to balance both and what pressure that's going to put on the family. So we actually take a holistic view. And I've actually had spouses come into meetings so that we could just sit down and fully explain what the experience is going to be and make sure that the family is ready for it. The extension to that is is the, not even with the scientist, it's if you're an entrepreneur, is raising this type of capital appropriate? Mm -hmm. So we sit down and have a lot of heart-to-heart -heart conversations about um, what does it mean to have somebody on your board? You're the founder, but now you've got a partner. Um, and whether you're a scientist dealing with the tenure issue or, or a software entrepreneur dealing with the financing issues, um, understanding that dynamic and, and how long a partnership that's going to be and what the demands and the requirements are going to be is a very important, very early stage conversation to have to, to make sure that you're all aligned from the beginning. It's a, it's a different environment, remember, also for the science, particularly the, the medical and the life sciences side, that these are people who are extremely good grant writers. <sighs> and they, they, so they know how to do the business plan. They can yeah. write those kinds of documents and they have people mm -hmm. around them that do that. The challenge is, is when you write an NIH grant, it's for science. And what we're talking about is net taking it to commercialization mm -hmm. and having to raise it from people who expect a return on their investment. The, the uh, you know, NIH is looking for great science and that to be shared and commercialized. The investor is looking for the commercialization and the translation of technology into cash flow. Very different, you know, set of dynamics that goes on there. And that's what the entrepreneur really needs to learn. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. When we come back, we're actually going to pick up on that point and talk a little bit more uh, about uh, how does an entrepreneur actually know how much money to, mm -hmm. to try to raise when, when he's speaking to, to one of you. We'll be right back after these words from some of our sponsors. Startup Insider is made possible by... The Entrepreneurship and Innovation Working Group of the Finger Lakes Regional Economic Development Council. Excel Partners, a Rochester-based national leader in seed stage venture investments. The Technical Entrepreneurship and Management Master of Science program at the University of Rochester. And this episode's feature sponsor, Complimar Partners, a market-leading global supply chain provider delivering value-add third-party logistics and packaging solutions that allow businesses to reduce cost, lower inventory, and improve performance. Welcome back to Startup Insider. Before we took the, uh, went to the break, we started talking about how much uh, it, it potentially costs to commercialize uh, a, a technology. Now, th I, I know that among entrepreneurs, there's always this, this common question, well, how do I know how much to ask for What's too little? What's too much? How does the, v the VC uh, see this type of question? Uh, Teresa, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, if the entrepreneur has done as asked and gone through the discipline of building a business plan, they should know what uh, they need to get to the first, what we call, valuation increasing milestone. And that might be something as simple as building a prototype that they can take out to the market and test a commercial grade prototype. In which case, depending on the kind of technology, could be something as little as eighty to hundred thousand dollars. On the other hand, another technology, depending on what they need to get to that next milestone, might be somewhere in the five hundred thousand or more range. When they come to Excel, we typically tell people to tell us what you think you need and not what you think you can get. Because we are a seed stage funder and people do their homework and understand that our average investment is around 250, they will come in with a plan based on what we see they need and they will still ask us for a very small amount and we'll say, can you really accomplish that for $250,000? And the answer is really no, mm -hmm. but that's what they think they can get. Mm -hmm. That's a wrong approach to take. I fully we'll agree with that. I, I think there's, there's a couple of points I think it can be made. Uh, certainly that's one of them. I, I would say from our experience, Rochester has a propensity to think that nothing goes wrong. And <laughs> we know and, and we expect things to go wrong. So yeah. to Teresa's point, one of the sh points I'd share with any entrepreneur is if you almost get there and you need money to get there, 
that second stage of money is going to be about four or five times as expensive as whether you're taking the money up front. Mm -hmm. Because I will take advantage of situations where, you know, the company needs it, there's not a lot of options, and if I'm the one with the checkbook, I'm by nature going to take advantage of that because that's my business to, to, to maximize that. Uh, and the other investors, unless they can continue to invest, and in, case, in the case of Teresa's fund, she doesn't have the ability to say match a million dollar investment on my part. So mm -hmm. I will, so as, as investors, we, we always want to be able to invest in that second round. Mm -hmm. So we might tell you, we're gonna give you a million dollars, but we want the right to invest in the next million dollars mm -hmm. because we wanna protect our, our position. And running short, of a partially completed project is extremely expensive. Well, and then that's really the new information you also have. Mm -hmm. When someone says that it's mm -hmm. going to take them two hundred fifty thousand right. dollars, and they come in and said, "and said, oh, I was, I was, I was a third off on yeah. that," mm -hmm. and now that you have a record that they're they're not able to right. predict things correctly, mm -hmm. that things will right. cost more later. Exactly. Right. It's, it's they've disappointed you, right. and, and entrepreneurs sh should try not to do that and, as and much and as possible. It's very important, as we've discussed earlier. It's very difficult to get an interview with a VC, so raising money is a time-consuming process. So once you're out there, you should get what you need for 12 to 18 months time period. And as- Plus six both months. Plus six <laughs> right. months. With the built-in mm -hmm. uh, things go bump in the night factor. Right. Mm -hmm. And then go ask for that amount of money. Because if you have to go back out again and ask, it is taking a complete, it's a complete distraction from your business, which takes you offline and can back up your ability to reach valuation increasing milestones. Everybody's always concerned about how much money do we raise and how much dilution is it because of how much of the company do I need to sell in order to get that capital. And we always counsel companies to, to not worry as much about the dilution, right? It's important to get as much capital as you need and to allow that you have a cushion for when things can go wrong. And the primary, the prime directive is don't run out. You know, mm -hmm. you, right. you can make sure you hit your target, but if you don't hit your target, what other things can you adjust to make sure that you don't run out of capital? We look to invest in companies usually, uh, almost always, when they're post-revenue and their product's already in the marketplace. So we're looking to finance the growth of the business, typically through sales and marketing. So we can take a lot of the uncertainty as to how long will it take for us to develop the product risk away, mm -hmm. but then if you need to hire salespeople and you need to put on a marketing budget, those are things that are a little bit easier to project. Right. We typically find it's for companies at our stage, it's one to two million dollars. I mean, so to this point of making sure you never run out, I know that at least among the entrepreneurs in the Finger Lakes area, what they oftentimes talk about in terms of their justification for wanting to ask more and have a relatively large cushion is uh, the perception that there just isn't nearly as much venture capital funding available to, to those of us mm -hmm. in the Finger Lakes, Rochester area as in other areas. So they have to be kind of especially careful because they don't have many mm -hmm. wells to go back to if, 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 if they don't succeed. I, I know, Teresa, this is a subject near and dear to your heart. Hey. Uh, is, there, is there a lack of venture capital in, in this community? Well, the picture is improving. Uh, that Let me start with that uh, punchline. Uh, Prior to the New York State uh, launching Innovate New York and establishing a seed fund in the state of New York, there was virtually no seed fund available in, particularly in upstate New York. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. With the arrival and establishment of, of Innovate New York, we now have seed money available and we now also have a more sophisticated group of angels in our community in upstate, both in Rochester, the Rochester Angel Network, in Buffalo, the Western New York Angels, and in Syracuse who have organized. They have now become key sources of, of uh, capital alongside the seed stage funders in upstate New York. So while we need more venture capital in this area, this, we have more now than we had before. And if I can wear my hat of the Upstate Venture mm -hmm. Association, one of the things that I think is unique and, and very positive about our community is that while there are not a lot of investors, we're a very collaborative community. Mm -hmm. It's not like other markets where if I see a company that's interesting, I'm not going to tell Kevin or Teresa. We all work together yeah. to help the companies grow, whether it's passing until the time is right to, and passing mm -hmm. them to another investor or co-investing. Uh, we've worked with Kevin, both Kevin and Teresa's firms mm -hmm. on companies that we've invested in together. So that collaborative environment um, encourage, encourages cooperation. And we think that even though the funnel to get to a funding point is still very narrow, um, it will increase the chances of success for the companies that actually achieve funding. Okay. I, I want to change topics a little mm -hmm. bit. Uh, 
uh, but, but kind of staying with it a little bit. Are there common mistakes that you see entrepreneurs, uh, especially those in the Finger Lakes uh, region, making when they approach all of you as part of this long strategy of, of, of getting money? At, at I, I guess some of the ones that, that we would see, um, perhaps they come too early and not, they're not prepared. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Teresa's process probably does a better job of vetting, so she doesn't really want to talk to them until they've gotten all the information in. We probably you know, put down our guard a little bit early and we'll talk to people and find out that, you mm -hmm. know, waste time, if you will, mm -hmm. that they've come a little bit too early. So that's probably one of them. Um, probably another one is they jump too quickly. They're too worried about, because they're initial entrepreneurs, they're too worried about how much they own or what their control is going to be mm -hmm. and all these things. And, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, control is, is a foolish topic to bring up until well into the negotiations and right. bring your lawyer into it because they don't even know the controls that any one of us has contractually. They look at how many shares I own and what percentages, and, and it's a foolish discussion. So they really need to focus on, you know, what am I trying to accomplish? If the opportunity is successful enough, there's more than enough money. All of us are more than generous to properly reward our entrepreneurs if they're successful. Mm -hmm. But don't come to me early and tell me I need 50% or I need this percent or whatever. It's a stupid discussion early common mistakes? Well, I would say probably crazy valuations. Mm -hmm. uh, receiving uh, valuations, someone comes to us and they have an, an idea. They do not have revenues. They have just formed their company. They do not even have a working grade prototype. That is usually something we're helping to fund. And when we ask them what their valuation is, their valuation will be like six to 10 million. Obviously, that's a non-starter, and we have to mm -hmm. kind of work backwards. And if they're, if we can help them see the light and see the rationale for where they should be, uh, then would you, then we would you give people a, a chance to actually? I mean, once they come to you with a ten million dollar valuation for a seed round, do you actually even try to show them the light, or is that? Oh, of, absolutely, yeah. because as, as Kevin has pointed out, our our marketplace is getting more sophisticated. The investor pitches that we see today. Mm -hmm are more sophisticated than they were five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. But they're still, to some extent, uninitiated in the process and their idea, and they have a belief in their business, and they know that if this succeeds, then it will be worth X. Well, it hasn't succeeded yet. You are totally unproven. And once we sit down with people and explain how evaluation is really approached, mm -hmm. most people do appreciate that thinking and can work back on it. It's a very different process too. I think a lot of people have been, they surround themselves with the wrong professionals and they have the belief that they set the pricing. Yeah. So they, they go out and they think that they're going to go to their local country club or amongst their friends and family and yeah. say, yeah, Alex will send you, sell you a $25,000 share of my company yeah. and you're going to get 2%. And a lot of times the naive investor right. doesn't do it. This is our living. You know, we, right. we do this for business. Yeah. So we have to understand how to do it we are in control of the process. If we're writing a half a million, a million, two million, five million dollar check, we'll tell you what the terms are. We're not going to ask, and Alex, you know that. Um, Kevin you know. brings up a very important point, though. Any entrepreneur that does go out and sell to family and friends at, a, at an unrealistic valuation and then comes to a professional to get funding finds a harsh reality and, mm -hmm. and oftentimes can really make it difficult for them to get funding because their cap table they is so messed up. They basically kind of trap mm -hmm. themselves. And, and also they alienate their friends and, and family that sold exactly at a ridiculous right. price. Right, because yeah. it's, yes, it's a down round. That's you know, exactly right. I think, I think a lot of those things in some ways are quality problems because you have to get to mm -hmm. the point where you're talking to investors and you have to get to the point where you have people who are willing to invest. As, as I think about mistakes and I think about tips for entrepreneurs, the things that, that we like to focus on are know who you're talking to. You know, we are a regionally focused investor. If you're in California, you're probably not watching the show, but if you're in California, we're unlikely to be investing in your company. Um, are you, if you're a dry cleaner, if, if, you're, if you're not a high growth company that's going to sell, if you're looking to build a business that you're going to pass on to your grandchildren, understand whether or not venture capital is right for you and then find mm -hmm. investors who are likely to be good targets. We don't invest, we're, we're, we're most likely not going to invest in a company where it's a scientist who's trying to cure cancer. So it might not be worth that entrepreneur's time to reach out to us, although we'll try and help them if we can. Know what you're getting yourself into. Understand who your partners are, what they're going to be looking for, and make sure that this kind of capital is right for you. Well, and this actually goes into my next segment, which is kind of the flip side of it. You talked about common mistakes. Uh, are there some things you can point to in terms of real tips for entrepreneurs, perhaps times where you have uh, talked to companies and said, wow, that was, that was particularly effective. They really, they really understood uh, how to do this. Are, are there those, those sorts of tips? I think uh, 
Forty percent of the uh, in the entrepreneurs fail at the investor pitch stage because they do not understand how to craft and put together a story, mm -hmm. and in a way that is concise and effective, and to help us understand what their technology is, that they have an understanding of the market, that and to give us a sense of who they are and their ability to stay committed to the process because we're trying to evaluate all three things in a 20 to 25 minute time frame. Mm -hmm. And it's critically important that they craft that investor pitch to accomplish that in that time frame. And most entrepreneurs fail at that particular junction. That's excellent advice. <laughs> I, I think another element that we always look for is don't ask us, don't ask us to invest in anything you wouldn't invest in. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the term sweat equity, and right. you don't realize how many hours I put into this, True. is a negative. If I see someone who has actually, you know, mortgaged their house, they've, they've committed themselves, they've accepted a salary much less than they were making, let's say, in a Eastman Kodak or Xerox Corporation locally, you know, that is a person who's committed and passionate. They're not looking for me to just, you know, be their new employer. I want to be your partner, and, mm -hmm. and I expect you to invest, co-invest with me. And co-investment, I do appreciate that you you put, you know, sweat equity into these things, but I also don't expect to be writing you a check and just, you know, making your payroll every month. You're in it with me. I, I would say don't wait too long to talk to customers. Too many early stage and seed stage businesses mm -hmm are spending their time in the lab, or they're spending their time sketching out and developing their products. Talk to customers, get customers who, who are willing to pay for something or are willing to try it. Because that's the, that's the earliest validation point that this is actually a product that's gonna be viable in the marketplace beyond being a good idea. Um, and I think that's something that, that a, lot of, a lot of entrepreneurs in the development stage, they're too busy developing. And let's, mm -hmm. let's make sure we're developing the right thing and delivering it on time. Thank you very much. Uh, this was a terrific discussion. I know from the standpoint of an entrepreneur, the things you're talking about are extremely valuable. I, I know I wish I'd known them uh, years ago, and, and, and I'm sure the people who are watching will, will learn a lot, and hopefully they won't uh, be coming to you with a $10 million valuation or just emailing you without, without knowing who you mm -hmm. are. Uh, and, and thank you very much for watching. Uh, this has been really important because venture capital really is the lifeblood of a healthy, uh, startup ecosystem. And as we all know, a healthy startup ecosystem is the key to economic development and growth and good jobs in our area. Thank you very much for, for watching and we'll see you on a future episode of Startup Insider.